Yo, what up, what up, what up? Welcome back to another episode of Ticking Grey Bomb, Refined Taste for Idiots. Um, so today, I want to continue in this vein of making some special content that I, we feel is both relevant for uh, the watch community as well as near and dear to our hearts. So I want to talk about the topic of German-made watches. And I believe this has been gaining steam in recent years. Um, and it's fair to say uh, this has grown from a niche phenomenon, maybe 20, 30 years ago, um, to something that's enjoying pretty broad-based support in the watch community. Uh, in preparing for this video, I can confirm there's a good amount of content uh, online about German watches and even comparing German watchmaking to Swiss watchmaking. So today I'd like to really paint a picture for you uh, of German watchmaking, give you a better idea of what it is, what it could be, uh, through the lens of my modest collection. So we're going to take a journey through five brands uh, and five pieces. I'd like to start by exploring, let's say, two to three main themes that come up a lot when we talk about German watchmaking. So the first is functionality at the expense of style. So we know that Swiss watches have a certain flair, um, have a certain kind of design aesthetic. Um, we know that German watches or right, uh, some of the, the brands associated with German watchmaking really known for their tool functionality. Okay, so, so even when we look at the word Flieger, right, in typical German fashion, it's very succinct, uh, right, flying watches, pilot watches, um, come directly from the German word for flying. And these watches really just appeared for the first time in the 1930s in the service of the German Air Force, the Luftwaffe. Right, we look at another theme that I wanna look at here is disruption or adversity, right? I mean, it's hard to talk about anything involving Germany over the last century without mentioning the impact of the Second World War and its aftermath. Um, so we can look at this uh, phenomenon in, uh, in, in a couple of contexts, right? The first one, right, we look at a major pole of German watchmaking around a fourth, fourth time in the Black Forest, right? Um, which is, was an area traditionally known for its jewelry making. Um, but I'd say they were lucky in a relative sense um, as many manufacturers who were in this region previous to World War II were able to come back in the 50s, right? And in contrast, it was much more difficult for the folks in Glashütte who saw their individual companies uh, basically appropriated by the Soviet Union who were in control of Saxony as part of kind of the East Germany, which became then the, um, the GDR, right? And in fact, all these companies, the companies that were operating in, in, in the Saxony region in Glashütte were actually all consolidated into one company called uh, GUB. Uh, and I may, I may butcher this, but um, which stands for Glashütte Ure Betreib, right? Uh, where basically they, they pumped out watches from, we can call it 1940, you know, the late 1940s until 1990, um, where they just pumped out watches for the workers of socialist East Germany, right? And it was only until after German reunification in 1990 that some of the brands that we know today as quintessentially German came into being. And some of those brands, right? I mean, we look at, uh, on the low end, right, Tutuma, uh, we have Nomos, which we'll look at today, Glashütte Original, uh, Moritz Grossmann, and uh, obviously probably the most famous, uh, Alanga and Sonum, right? Um, and so the flip side of that, uh, of that kind of um, history is the fact that when we look at um, tradition in watchmaking industry, uh, it's easy to look at some of the most famous Swiss brands, right, and Maisons. Um, look at Vacheron Constantine, right, founded in 1755. Um, Yaga Lecoutre, right, uh, 1833. Patek Philippe, 1839. And Audemars Piguet, 1875. So um, very kind of storied. The Swiss watchmaking industry definitely has this, um, this core um, tradition, right, that they, that they, that they often speak to and depend on in terms of their branding, right? 
Um, and we can, we can say that watchmaking has existed for centuries in Germany, but the, the German brands that we know today, certainly some of the most popular German brands, really are only a few decades old, right? Uh, which means that they could feel freer in using new materials or innovating around different technologies to achieve um, some of their branding aspirations, right? And we'll look at that today. Um, the final topic, I guess the final theme that we could look at when talking about German watches, um, and I give credit to Tim at Caseback Watches because he pointed out the fact that um, a lot of these German watch companies today are still independent. They may be family owned um, still, right? And really only Glashütte Original, which is owned by the Swatch Group, and Langa, uh, which is owned by Richemont. So really the two, some of the, I would, you could say the two on the highest end of, uh, of German watchmaking are owned by large conglomerates, but the rest of these companies are still independent, which, which says a lot, right, in terms of their, their commitment to the market, their, um, their ownership of certain designs and design aesthetics and, and, and purposes. So uh, those, those are some really cool um, themes that I'd like to put out there that we'll kind of test um, over the course of our time together today. So, um, Another kind of caveat that I want to put out there about this video is that the list of watches and brands that we're going to look at today is by no means exhaustive, okay? And it's not even, um, I mean, it's really only a fraction of, of German watchmaking, and I'm not in any way categorizing these as the best brands. Um, we're looking at five brands, and uh, through those five brands, we can look at specific pieces, pieces that I own, right? And we can kind of deep dive into what those watches can offer uh, an enthusiast. Um, but, you know, ultimately, I hope they'll give you some valuable insight into a watchmaking heritage that has tended to be overlooked um, or not given a sufficient amount of focus on. So, um, you know, I already mentioned case back watches, but before we, we conclude this first part of the video, I do want to, 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 to also uh, give a shout out to Tocant, um, because Caseback and Tocant really uh, had offered some really unique and informative perspectives for me in trying to pull this, this topic together, okay? Um, now, I think what we'll do is we'll start to flip the camera and start to look at some of these, these watches. Um, and we'll, we've ordered them roughly, I've ordered them roughly in order from least expensive to most expensive regarding the specific pieces we'll look at today. So we'll look at the founding dates of the companies, some price ranges within their, uh, their portfolio, uh, and unique elements that each brand offers, kind of that make the, uh, the, brand, the brand offering relevant. Let's flip the camera and take a look at some of these pieces today. So guys, here's a look on what's gonna be on offer today. Five specific brands, all German produced, and we'll take a, a brief drill down into these guys. And we'll look at the first piece, which will be this Stova. So Stova was founded in Svorsheim in 1927. Okay, they had their origin in making pilot's watches for the Luftwaffe, as we said earlier. Um, today, Stova is still very proud of its location in the Black Forest and is operating in a modern facility built in 2008. Stova offers 58 models, ranging from 790 euros to just under 3,000 euros across six main families. But of course, they're best known for their Flieger or pilot's watches. Um, their website is very user-friendly and gives you the ability to customize just about every watch. Uh, no in-house movements at Stova, but all offerings are either Swiss-made Salida um, Automatic or Salida United's hand-winding. This Stova model that we're looking at today is the 6498 Bronze Vintage Flieger. Um, I paid about 1,700 euros, including shipping to the U.S. Um, they do order, offer an immediate VAT discount for anything shipped outside the Eurozone. Um, and I'd say the primary element that attracted me to this watch was the hand-winding Unitas 
6498 movement. So you see it back here. Um, it's pretty legendary within this community. Um, 17 jewels, Swiss made. Um, really, for again, for a watch in this price range, some nice finishing uh, on the movement. Nice to have that um, display case back. So a bronze case, um, first bronze piece in my collection. Um, now, I have to say I've unboxed this for, uh, for the channel before, and uh, we will link that unboxing video uh, so you can get all the specifics on this watch. Um, I do want to mention that a brand very similar to Stova that we won't look at today would be Laco. Um, Laco shares a very similar history to Stova, um, founded in, I think founded just three years before um, Stova, uh, located in a similar geography and a heritage in a, in a similar way, right? And I could say in some ways, I'm sure you guys have experienced this, um, it's hard to really um, identify any major differences between the Fliegers produced by both brands um, today or in the past for that matter. Um, so hope you enjoy uh, this guy. I know I certainly do. The next brand we'll look at today is Damasco. Now, Damasco is the youngest of all the brands we'll feature today, um, founded in 1994 as a specialty metalworking machine shop, um, where some like some Swiss brands, uh, they got their start in manufacturing cases for other German brands, namely Zinn. Uh, if we looked at Stova as the perfect example of that tool watch designed for a specific purpose, uh, we could see Damasco as a clear example of German manufacturing and materials innovation. Um, they leverage their metalworking expertise to deliver some really groundbreaking technology in the watch arena. So some of the things we can highlight here um, in Damasco watches, right, are superior hardness of metals, uh, both cases and bracelets through both treatments and coatings. Um, the majority of their models are equipped with an ice-hardened nickel-free casing made from their patented martinistic stainless steel. Um, don't say that 10 times fast. Um, and it's completely hardened through a special process that's four times harder than conventional stainless steel. So that 316L stainless steel that everyone talks about, uh, this special hardening process um, results in something that's, that's really, really tough. Um, tough not just from a, let's say, a crack resistance standpoint, but also a, a scratch resistance standpoint. Um, Damasco also offers sophisticated anti-magnetic protection. Um, they have patented lubricated crowns and pushers for chronos um, to minimize wear and ensure effective use over long periods of time. So see these, these here, right? The chrono was already running, so we'll restart that. But, but basically, it's exactly these, um, this type of functionality. Um, and they have a patented EPS spiral as well in the movement. So um, they do produce several in-house calibers, right? Such as the C51, which is based off the legendary Valjoux 7750 chronograph. Um, these movements are designed to be robust, reliable, and low maintenance, um, and feature some of the innovative technologies that we talked about, right? Such as ceramic ball bearings, self-lubricating coatings, and silicone parts. Um, now, Damasco also uses some ETA in their entry-level models, such as the DA30. So they, they have a, a wide range of offerings, right? Uh, they price their watches from the entry-level the entry level Flieger, so like that DA30, um, at 1645 euros, uh, to their high-end dress chronos, right, which go for uh, 4,600 euros. Um, very affordable. I would say, even at that high-end price point, uh, very affordable for in-house movements and advanced technologies um, that they offer, right? This piece here is the DC-80 with the dual time zone bezel, uh, bi-directional bezel, okay? Um, it goes from 
1 to 12, so you can track a second time zone if needed. Um, they also have a bezel, um, a diving bezel with 60 clicks, okay, um, if you need to use this as a dive timer. Um, this model actually is the previous generation. It was uh, very recently updated to the DC-80 Stroke 2 um, after they pushed through a price increase in November 2023. Um, so this refresh, the refresh model of this, of this piece uh, retails for about 3,300 euros. Um, the main differences between this base model or the older model and the, uh, the new generation um, are they put in darted hands. So this have pretty kind of basic uh, straight hands. They put in darted hands that you might see on a Flieger, a modern Flieger. Um, they updated the bezel um, potentially for better legibility. Um, and they wrote central, minute, counter, military certified on the dial, okay? And this refers to their partnership with Airbus Defense and Space, um, further kind of reinforcing this sense that, um, that this is a real kind of purpose-built tool watch for some pretty, um, pretty demanding conditions. So again, we'll look at this, um, the back, which kind of talks to specifically what what it has, right? You got this nickel-free um, steel compound, 100 meters uh, of water resistance. Okay, that, that's the 10 bar. Um, sapphire crystal, um, you know, and it has this kind of material, this, uh, sorry, um, the ceramic bezel and this magnetic resistance. Um, now, I, I did also did an unboxing of this watch, uh, which will link in the description below. Um, so you can see all the cool technology that's packed in here. Um, take a deeper dive into this, this great DC-80. So hey guys, I'm gonna invite you to come back for part two, where we look at the final three German watch brands uh, and watches in my collection. And I think you're gonna love these guys. Bye bye.